We're dining with Jesus this morning. Grab your Bible and head over to the Gospel according to John, John chapter 2 this morning. Uh, We're going to be looking at John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 as we continue in this series that we've entitled Dining with Jesus. Now we can do a thought experiment real quick. You know, there's many people in our life that, or in history that we may want to go back and uh, if we had a chance to have a meal with them and sit with them, there are lots of people. But I think every single one of us in here would say, one of those people I'd like to sit with and talk with and understand kind of what he was all about is Jesus. You see, Jesus, uh, the Gospel of Luke, as we learned last week, Jesus came uh, for many reasons, but he came as his main mode of, of ministry. He came, Luke chapter 7, verse 34 tells us, eating and drinking. And we, we like a, a Jesus that likes to eat and drink, because we like to eat and drink. And what better place for a good food or a good meal than at a wedding? A wedding. Those of us who in here have been, are married or have been married, uh, we, you know, when you plan a wedding, normally you plan for a reception, right? And I still remember our reception, our wedding was outside, it was a beautiful, spirit-filled time for Megan and I to be married, but I still remember the food that we ate at our wedding. And you want to guess what it was? It was barbecue. I was, listen, I was destined to be in Eastern Carolina because I've always loved barbecue. We, I still remember, you know, normally as the, the groom or the bride, you don't get a chance to eat very much, but I got to scarf down a plate sitting in the back of a car real quick of barbecue. It was some really good barbecue. I still remember that meal. It was a good meal because uh, we were celebrating. We were celebrating something wonderful, something great. And, and we, praise God, never ran out of anything. But there is a wedding in the Bible, in John chapter 2, where, unfortunately, they ran out of something, and Jesus is going to be there to fix the problem. In this passage today, we're going to see four different conflicts, four different problems that crop up in the text, four different things that we need to address this morning as we read this passage. So I ask you, as as we honor the reading of God's Word, that you stand with me. We're going to read John chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1. Through 11. Let's stand together as we honor God's word and see these conflicts that are going to be resolved here within the passage. This is, is God's holy word. John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to them, him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. But his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. May God add that faith, that belief to our heart this day. You may be seated. As I said, we have some conflicts in this passage. I see at least four. You can probably pull pull out a bunch more. But there are at least four conflicts in this passage. The first one we find right there at the beginning. So they come. On the third day, there, there was a wedding at, at this Can- and Cana in Galilee. Now, this is, Jesus's, this is Jesus' hometown. We're talking about 10 miles away from where Jesus grew, grew up. And so he's in his home turf. And so he uh, is invited along with his mother. And so he's there with the five disciples that he has already called in John's gospel. And he's there with his mother. And so there, there's no conflict there, obviously. They're, they're just enjoying a wedding. They're there enjoying the festivities of the wedding. 
And so this wedding, uh, in, in ancient days, weddings were a big deal. Uh, we still make weddings out to be a big deal, but they were an even bigger deal in those days. You know, we go to parties all the time. Weddings were really the only parties that they would have. They would, they would kind of go overboard for these wedding feasts. And so sometimes weddings, after the, the actual wedding day, wedding feasts could last a week or more. And so we're talking about a week-long party to celebrate the union between these two people. And so this, this, you know, this is great. He's at this party. He's, he's enjoying himself. He's there with his disciples. And then we come to verse 3. Verse 3 introduces the first conflict in the passage. Look at it with me. When the wine ran out. When the wine ran out. You see, the party had been raging for several days at this point, most likely. And then they came to this point in the party where they had no more wine. Now, we can talk a lot about what wine is here, and some people say, well, it's just grape juice. Some, no, what we're talking about here is wine. It's real wine. It's, it's something that if you drink enough of it, it will get you drunk. And in the scriptures, if we were to look through all of the scriptures in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, wine is always associated with great joy. In fact, in Proverbs, it tells us that, that, that wine, when, when there is no wine, there is no joy. And so this wine here is, is a kind of a symbol for the joy of the party. The party was, was moving forward and, and the joy was going to be taken away. And, and here was the big thing. This is the big problem here. They ran out of wine. And in this culture, a, a culture that, you know, we don't uh, really live in a culture like this, but this was a shame culture. And, and think about this. This was the one party that everyone was going to come to in the year. And, and I, I don't know the, the name of, of the guy that got, or the people that got married here, but just imagine, we do know there's a bridegroom, so there's a groom, right? So he, he, who knows what his name was, right? Joe or whatever, right? Joe was responsible for making sure there was enough food and enough wine and enough stuff to make the party last until it was done, until the seven days or, or a week or however long it was going to be that it would be done. And so this not only was, uh, you know, just a problem uh, with, with the party was going to have to be ended, it was a problem because the bridegroom had not made proper plans to, f to have enough wine to end the party. Okay, so here we have this, this situation that comes up, this conflict that comes up. And so here, here's what the mother of Jesus says. He go, she goes to Jesus and she says, they have no wine. They have no wine. I want to ask you a question. What do we do in our lives when the wine runs out? What do we do in our lives when the wine runs out? When the joy runs out? When the wine of our youth begins to run out? When the wine of our wealth begins to fade away? When the wine of our health becomes a problem. When the wine of control, the wine of comfort, the wine of, of joy begins to run out. What do we do? A better question is what do we do when our own plans and our own effort come to the end? What do we do when our own planning and our own effort run out? What do we do? Well, many of us in here, what do we do? We just try to go to plan B. We try to go to plan C, plan D. But what happens when we get down to plan Z and we still don't have a solution to the problem? What happens then? Because guess what? It's going to run out in our life at some point. For some of us, we've experienced this. For some of us, we've gotten that phone call where we had to go in to the doctor's office and we had to sit as they told us we had cancer. We had to sit while, while, while the doctor said, look, hey, look, your knee, it's not going to ever get any better. You're old, and we can replace it, but it's not going to get any better. We, we, we've we've saw, looked at our, our bank account back in 2008 when, when the, the stock markets crashed and, and people lost their entire life savings. It can run out. And the question this morning that we have to ask ourselves is what do we do when that runs out? What do we do when the wine runs out? We, when we come to the end of ourselves, when, when our best laid plans, when, when our effort isn't enough, what do we do? 
Look what Jesus' mother did here. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. What do we do when the wine of our youth runs out? What do we do when the wine of control, when the wine of health, the wine of wealth, the wine of different things in our life run out? What do we do? We do what the mother of Jesus did, and we take it, the problem, to Jesus. Listen, my... All of us in here, we, we have plans for how our life is going to go. We have plans for how our church is going to be. We have plans for how our kids are going to be. And guess what? Some of us have, have, have come to the end of ourselves when it comes to our kids or when it comes to our church or when it comes to our life. And what do we do when we, we realize the wine is gone? There's no none left. Well, we can try to try to fix the problem on our own, but what we must do when the wine of our life runs out, we must take our problem Notice what she does. She doesn't come to him in, in, in panic. She, doesn't, she simply brings the problem to Jesus. They have no wine. This first conflict is resolved by bringing the problem to Jesus. So this morning, if you're in here and the wine is running low, the wine is out, bring the problem to Jesus. He's willing, he's wanting, he's waiting to hear from us. Because guess what? When the, there's nowhere else to look when the wine runs out. And Mary knew that. And so she brings the problem to Jesus, which brings us to the second conflict of this story. Look at it there with me in verse 4. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet Come. Conflict number two is between Jesus and his mom. Now, let me just tell you something. This is not the sweet Jesus that we like to think of, right? The sweet, frail Jesus with the halo behind his head. This is not sweet Jesus that we like, we, we've come to, to, to know. This is a different Jesus. Because guess what? If I, to this day, called my, my mother, not in a joking way, in a serious way, woman, she would slap me from here to kingdom come. <laughs> Imagine that. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. Some of you, are, your mom's right here. And you, if you said woman, right? Not in a joking way. In a serious way. That's what he does. It's a serious thing that he's saying here. Now, there are many commentators that want to try to soften the blow of what Jesus is doing here by saying, oh, well, woman, that, that can mean, you know, like, dear woman, or, or, or she's dearly loved. But, but this is simply the word for woman. And listen, listen if, if that, if we, we can undercut it by trying to do some Greek gymnastics, but what he says next tells us that he was in conflict. He was conflicted, maybe within himself, but he was conflicted with his mom. Look at what he says next. Woman, what does this problem have to do with me? What, 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 why are you bringing this to me? Why, why, my hour, what does he say? My hour has not yet come. Now, now we, we can look at this and we can see that Jesus, at the very least, the, the writer here, John, wants us to see that there's a, there is a conflict between Jesus and his mother. But listen, it's going to be very quickly taken care of in the very next verse. But really what I think the writer wants us to see is there's a conflict within Jesus. Jesus himself is conflicted. You might say, well, how do you know that, Andrew? Well, he responds to his mother in a way that's like, look, my hour has not yet come. It, it, it has this idea that he's thinking of another time. He's thinking of another place. H have you ever been in a place and, and, and you're sitting there and you're there physically, but you're somewhere else a million miles away? That's what Jesus, where Jesus was. Now, we could say maybe the conflict here is that he was at a wedding and he was single, right? Many of you have been single at a wedding. And you, it's hard. It's hard to sit there. Or maybe you're, you've been single or you've been with, with your partner at the wedding and, and you, get, you, know, you start giving the little hints like, when am I going to get the, the ring, right? What this, look at what, how beautiful this could be, right? But I don't believe that's the conflict that Jesus is having. He's not saying, well, where's my woman, right? Where's my person? The conflict here is about the hour. And so for us to understand what's going on in Jesus' mind, we have to understand what he's talking about when he says, my hour has not yet come. What is he talking about here? 
Well, any time in the Gospel of John and any time in the Gospels, when Jesus mentions his hour, he's talking about the hour of his eventual crucifixion, his eventual death. And so he says, look, my hour, the time of my death, has not yet come. Why was he thinking in that moment at a wedding about his death? Why? Well, you want to know why he was thinking that? Because this scenario, this wedding feast, reminded him of something that was going to happen in the distant future. We read in Revelation chapter 19, Then I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, John, the same author who wrote these words about Jesus running out of, uh, about this, this bridegroom running out of wine, wrote these words in Revelation. The angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You see, where Jesus' mind was was a million miles away, thousands of years into the future, at another marriage supper, at another celebration. And Jesus understood something, and we need to understand it today. There was an internal conflict within Jesus because he knew in order for us and for him to get to that marriage supper, In order for us to be able to be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, he was going to have to suffer and die. He knew that in order for this marriage supper to happen, in order for us to be able to sit around a table with Jesus and to laugh it up and and to drink of the joy that he can give, he knew he was going to have to suffer and die. See, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In order for us to have ultimate joy, in order for us to be reunited with God, God had to come down in the form of man, live a perfect, sinless life, die a death that he did not deserve, so that we, one day, could drink and eat at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's what Jesus was going through his mind. My hour has not yet come. I can imagine that Jesus was walking around this wedding saying, man, what a celebration. And I look forward to that celebration one day when we can all sit together at the table of the Lord. But I'm going to have to go through it. I'm going to have to go through it. You see, I don't like to read these things into the scriptures all that often, but I believe in this moment, in this story, at that wedding, he was thinking about you, and he was thinking, He was thinking about us sitting around this table. And he realized if that were going to be a reality, he was going to have to suffer and die for us. So conflict is brought here. This internal conflict becomes an external conflict. But really, if we look at this, there really was no conflict between Mary and, his, uh, Mary and, his, and Jesus. There was no conflict between Jesus and his mother. Because... Of the faith of Mary. Look at the faith of Mary here in verse 5. His mother, he, I mean, she basically just ignored what he just said. And turned to the servants, it says, do whatever he tells you. You see, Mary may have known, maybe he, she knew that he was thinking about something else. He knew she was, he was saying something else, but the conflict was quickly resolved. Because Mary had faith that Jesus was going to take care of the problem. And she had faith. Listen, we can have faith that Jesus can take care of our problem. Why? Because he took care of the biggest problem that all of us have. The biggest problem that all of us have. And it's a big S word. Not that S word. It's sin. That is the biggest problem that all of us have. Sin. And Jesus came to take care of that. And if he can take care of that problem, how much more can he take care of a small little problem of turning some water into wine? 
And so the question remains, what are we going to do when the wine runs out? What are we going to do when the wine runs out? Are we going to panic? Are we going to worry? Are we going to be like Mary, like the mother of Jesus, and have faith that Jesus is going to use the situation for his glory and to increase our faith? Listen, there are times in our life where we come to the end of ourselves and we're like, how can Jesus work this out? How can he make something happen in this situation? And every time he can use it for his glory and for our faith. Two conflicts down, two more to go. The third conflict here is found in verse 7. Verse 6 and following. Look at it there with me. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. That's a lot. Talking about 180 gallons here. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. Now, Let's just stop right here. This is crazy. (laughs) There's no other way to to say it. This is crazy. The problem is there's no wine. The problem is that they need wine to keep the party going. They need wine so that the bridegroom will not be shamed. Listen, if, if, if the party stopped, that bridegroom would have been the talk of the town for years. Imagine, imagine you go to a wedding, right? You're invited, you RSVP, because you didn't crash, right? You, you, you RSVP, and you checked, check, checked on the box, I want fish. Now it comes time for the, 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 the feast, the wedding feast, right? And they, the, the servers are coming out, they're bringing out all the, the food, and they get to you, and they look at you and say, sorry, we're out of fish. Got some chicken if you want it, but we're out of fish. What would go through your mind? Just be real honest, right? What would go through your mind? I RSVP'd. I planned ahead. Why didn't you plan for my... I I told you I was coming. I told you I wanted fish. I don't want chicken. I've been looking forward to this fish all day. I had to sit through that entire wedding. It was great. Yes, it was great, but it was a little bit boring, okay? Just going to be honest. I'm here to celebrate the love, but but I, I was looking forward to this fish. What would you... I mean, think about if you're close to this person, what would you be saying to them for years? You remember your wedding? (laughs) No fish. You probably even play a joke on them. You, you, you like hey, invite them out to dinner. Hey, uh, invite them over to your house for dinner and, and be like, hey, we're having fish. But then all of a sudden you do a switch, right? You bring out the chicken. Say, guess what? No fish today. We're having chicken. Right? You do, think about that. You, you would be talking about, and, and that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen to this bridegroom. He's going to be the talk of the town for, for ages. Shame. And so in order to avoid the shame, in order for the party to keep going, they needed wine. That was the problem. And Jesus says something crazy. He says, look, you know these six stone pots that are over here? You know the ones that you use to to wash your hands, that the guests use to wash their hands, the ones you use to wash all the plates and stuff? I want you to fill those up with water. Imagine what was going through those servants' head. Water? Jesus? We don't need water. (laughs) We need wine. I, I imagine, I, I, I don't think they just had the water right there. They probably had to go to a well and get the water. So imagine every time they went to the well, and we're talking about 180 gallons here. We're not talking about some small water pots. And every time, whoa, Jesus, what is he doing with water? And every time, you know, every time, I can imagine that ser- servant's grumbling and playing Mary out. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Jesus isn't going to fix this problem, right? Every time. Well, it doesn't make sense to the servants, but they're going to the well every time and bringing it in till they fill up six water pots full of water. Can I tell you something this morning? When it comes to the problems in our life, sometimes what Jesus is telling to us to do does not make sense to us. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. Why? Because look at the faith of these these servants. Jesus said to the servants, fill the water, jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. It didn't say, and they said, oh Jesus, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in my life. Uh, maybe, Maybe later, let me pray about it. No. They immediately obeyed. They immediately did the thing that they were called to do by Jesus. Look at what else he says. He said to them, verse 8, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. Okay, so, hold on, Jesus. Wait, 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 wait wait a second. 
What you're telling me is I'm going to fill up these pots that, that are full of filthy, I mean, they're used to, to cleanse our hands and to do all those things. I'm going to fill those up, and then I'm going to scoop that water, and I'm going to take it, take the water to, to the master of ceremonies, to the, to the guy who, who, who knows, I mean, he, who's tasted wine over and over and over again. He's going to know it's water, Jesus. He's going to know it's water. And yet, even though it did not make sense, it did not make sense what they were doing, they did it anyway. And look at what happens. Verse 9. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn it, the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. You see, that didn't make sense in these servants' mind that they were going to bring to the, the, this man who knew wine. I mean, that was his job. His job was to make sure the party kept going, that the wine that was served was up to snuff, that the wine that was served was in a certain way. Look, they even had a plan. We're going to get everybody kind of, you know, feeling pretty good about, about the wine, and then we're going to bring out the, the cheap stuff right? The box wine, you know, let, let's serve them the good stuff, the high high dollar bottles first, and then we can bring out the two buck chuck, right? Th th that's what they were trying to do. That, that they were trying to pull one over, and, and, and the, the master of the, the ceremonies there goes, look, you kept the best for now. How could you do that, bridegroom? How could you do that? Well, we'll notice that it's all dependent on the obedience of the servants. The, the servants in this story— if they did not have the faith to do what Jesus told them to do, they wouldn't have the good wine. Can I just tell you something this morning? Jesus calls us to do things in our life that don't make sense. You might say, Andrew, no, everything that Jesus has ever told me makes sense. Can I just tell you, it did not make sense in my life for me to uproot my young family and to come to Goldsboro, North Carolina, to pastor a church. It did not make sense. Physical sense, business sense, it didn't make anything. But Jesus told me to come. And so I did it. It didn't make sense. And listen, God is calling a lot of us to do things that don't make sense. You mean I'm supposed to love that person at work that hates me? Yeah. Jesus told us to love our enemies, to, to do unto others as you would have them do to us. You mean I'm supposed to love that person who, who's had a grudge against me their whole life? Yes, yes, it doesn't make sense, but we are supposed to do it. And you know what happens when we do that? You know what God does with our obedience? You know what God did with those servants' obedience? He is the one who brings the miracle. It doesn't make sense that I should yell at you every Sunday. It doesn't make sense. I don't know why God called me to do it. But I do it. I yell at you every Sunday. I do. I yell at myself more. I can just be honest. But I do it not so that I can affect some kind of change I, in your life. I do it because God has called me to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. To tell you and tell every single person that will listen to me that you need Jesus. I need Jesus. And guess what? I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to keep carrying the water. I'm going to keep serving the water. And I need Jesus to do the work of turning that water into wine. Can I tell you that this morning? The Holy Spirit of God is the one who has to do the work in your heart. And guess what? I've realized this over the past two weeks. Sometimes I just need to get out of the way and let the Spirit of God work. And let the Spirit of God do His work. Sometimes in our lives. We have to just keep carrying that water. Keep being obedient to what Jesus is saying. Even though it doesn't feel like it's right, even though it doesn't seem like it's going to do anything, we have to keep carrying that water. And in that, he can work and he can do the miracle. Listen, those servants didn't turn that water into wine. Those servants did not turn that water into wine. Jesus did. And he did it because they were obedient. What do we do when the wine runs out? We bring the problem to Jesus, and we do whatever he tells us to do, knowing that he is the one 
that's going to bring the miracle. That brings us to our final conflict in this passage. Very, very last one. It's the very last verse of the, of, the, of the one, and it's the biggest conflict in my mind. All those other conflicts, they make sense. It makes sense that we, we should bring our problems to Jesus. It makes sense that he's the one that's going to have to do the work. It makes sense. But this last one, it never has made sense to me. But Jesus, I believe God, even this week as I was reading through this, he, he showed me something that maybe I, I hadn't thought about before. Look at verse 11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. And it manifested, that is, it showed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So the, there's no conflict in what this miracle did, right? It showed who he was. It showed his glory. It showed what he was all about. That was the point of this miracle. And it makes sense. The disciples believed him even more because they saw this whole thing. They saw the best wine being saved right till the end. The conflict that, I, that, that comes to my mind is and this comes from my years of working at Chick-fil-A and working at Cookout and, and working with marketing. This is the worst PR move Jesus could ever have made. It is. Why would he choose this miracle? Why would he choose turning some water into wine as the very first miracle that he would do? You, you know what the miracle was? He kept the party going. <laughs> he kept the party going. Why, why is that the miracle that he chose? Man, uh, come on. If I were Jesus, I would have picked as my opening act, right? Raising someone from the dead. Think about that for a second. Not only did I raise someone from the dead, do something that no one can do, now I have somebody to walk around with and show to everyone that will listen, this man raised me from the dead. At the very least, at the very least, he should have healed someone. Just heal someone, man. Heal someone that was very obviously sick, right? Someone who had leprosy or somebody who couldn't see. Like, heal that person. Then that person can go around and tell everyone about Jesus, right? But that's not what he chose. He chose to turn some water into wine. He chose to keep the party going. Why, Jesus? Why is that the first miracle that you wanted to set the tone of your ministry by? Why this miracle? Jesus... God spoke to me this week, and he said something very clearly to me. Jesus cares about our joy. Jesus cares about our joy. He cares about where we're receiving joy, but he cares about our joy. I wouldn't have chosen to do this, but Jesus did it to show that he is the one. It's through him and him alone, I might add, that we can have true and lasting joy. What did the bride, what did the, the master of ceremonies say to the bridegroom? What did he say to him when the, when the wine brought to him? Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Can I tell you something this morning? If we're trying to find our joy in the right here and right now, we're missing out on the good wine that is to come. Because guess what? Jesus has saved the good wine. And there's coming a day when we will all sit around that that marriage supper of the Lamb, and we can enjoy and drink deeply from the joy that is ours because of what Jesus has done, because of what Jesus did as his first miracle to set the tone for what he was going to be. He was going to be the ultimate joy giver. Listen, if, if we think back to, to the Old Testament, we think back to the way that people found joy throughout their entire life, they found joy, right, through trying to be who Adam and Eve tried to find joy through knowing good and evil. People tried to find joy through, through different sinful acts, through different things. that, But ultimately, joy is found in Jesus. You know, there are many times in the Bible that I would love to— tra If I had a time machine, there's tons of places I would love to travel back to. I'd love to stand there when there was nothing. And out of that nothing, God spoke, and everything came into existence. I'd love to be there when— the deep broke open and, and the 
rain rain for 40 days and 40 nights and the floods covered the whole earth. I'd love to see all those animals packed into that ark. I'd love to be there on, on the mountain when Abraham is coming down with that knife and he's about to sacrifice Isaac and, and, and God's hand stops him from sacrificing Isaac. There's many, I'd love to see David and hear the beautiful music that he played. There's many places that I would love to go in the Bible. Can I tell you the one place I want to go? I want to go to this party. And I want to taste, responsibly, taste this wine. You want to know why? I bet you it is the best wine that ever was. And it's a picture of the wine that one day we will drink sitting at the table with Jesus. It'll be worth it all. We sing it. When we see his face. And you know what? We're about to sing this. I want you more than gold or silver. Only you can satisfy. And here's the line. You ready for it? You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. Where are we finding our joy this morning? Are we finding it in the things of now? Are we looking forward to the time when we can sit with Jesus around his table? What are we going to do when the wine runs out? We turn to Jesus because he's there to fix the problem. Let's pray. Brother, you are the real joy giver. And we know this because Jesus came in the form of of humanity. And he didn't come, God, just like some, as some kind of holy cleric or some kind of, you know, holier, mightier than thou person. He came, the Bible tells us, eating and drinking. We thank you for a God, for a Jesus that comes eating and drinking because that means we can find true joy. Father, I pray that your spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, would right now be doing the work as I've faithfully carried this water today. And I've let everybody taste of it. But God, would you turn that water into wine this morning so that we can taste and see that you are good, that we can taste and see that you are the true joy giver. Father, change hearts, change minds this morning. We rely on you to do the work. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake.